What is a social enterprise? And how can we use that in our innovation journey? I have very much enjoyed this chat to Tom Dawkins from Start Some Good. There's no doubt a lot of opportunities lay in the social space for businesses. Our consciousness has been awakened even more with COVID. Businesses that focus on the social need and are driven to make our world better will stand out for the right reasons. Welcome to the Engage to Innovate podcast. Hi, I'm Judy Selmans. You know, our world evolves through innovation and as business leaders, we have to step out of our comfort zone, which is never easy heading into totally new territory. But this podcast is all about helping you tackle that adventure. We talk to people who have done it before and those who have worked with innovators. So let's get started on our next journey of discovery. Welcome to our stage, Tom. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. You know, I'm just going to jump right in. I think, but I have a feeling you might challenge my thinking today, Mm -hmm. that a social enterprise is either a not-for-profit or some wonderful person that had a vision like distributing fresh water to those that need it. So how far out am I? Uh, you're kind of in the right ballpark, I guess. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's the, the the problem is probably that there's no distinction between that and, and a not-for-profit approach to distributing fresh water. And so the, the key thing to, I guess, clarify with social enterprise is that they're using trade to pursue a social impact. And so if you just want to give water to people who don't have it, it's probably not a social enterprise idea. It's probably a charity okay. idea. And there's a, there's a need for lots of charities in the world as well. There is, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a social enterprise zealot that thinks that social enterprises should replace charities. They should complement them. But a social enterprise would be if you'd figured out a way to sell clean water to people who need it at a price they could afford in a way that also perhaps um, ensures environmental sustainability. Okay. No, that makes total sense. Okay. Can... So do existing businesses, can they become social enterprises? Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, I mean, you know, we don't have a, we, there's not a single kind of technical definition of a social enterprise. So the exact line between being, you know, a, a, a typical business and then being a business that's doing a few ethical things and then a business that's getting a bit more involved and then becoming a social enterprise is a bit of a blurry line. Uh, because there isn't this one clean, you know, like you, you, you're you're a, you're a not for profit or a for profit. That's a very binary, you know. You're, yeah. You're, you're one or the other. Social enterprise is a little bit more fluid because it is about how we leverage business models to to support impact models. Um, and so existing businesses can absolutely do that. Um, but it, what what to me is really important and what truly defines a social enterprise is that the impact model has to be at the heart of the business. So let's say you're a you're a cafe and you want to be a social yep. enterprise um, or you want to be socially minded. So what, what you might do is kind of do a lot of positive things but are on the outside. And I'm not saying those are, those are good things to do, but, you know, you might buy only fair trade coffee beans. Yep. You, you, might send your, you might send your used coffee grounds to a, you know, organic waste recycling facility. You might have a spare meeting room that you make available for free to local community groups if they want to host meetings at your cafe. Those are all cool things to do, but none of them will make you a social enterprise on their own because they're all kind of around the edges. Yeah. And so to me, what makes you a social enterprise is when the business model is at the very core of the business. So much so that if you removed that impact model from the business, the business would more or less fall over. It wouldn't function because it's an actually, you're describing key parts. So for instance, a social enterprise cafe might be focused on creating employment opportunities to young people who are at risk of homelessness, like say street in Melbourne. Yeah. Yeah. So if you took that away, they couldn't run those businesses at all because they wouldn't have staff. Right. But in the case of like, but you could, you know, you could swap out fair trade beans for other beans. You could stop making your meeting room available for free. None of those would actually kind of change the core cafe business. So that's kind of the distinction I see between business, between kind of ethical businesses, which is important, mm. people who are doing the right things kind of around the edges of their business. And I don't, I don't mean to say around the edges in a way that dismisses. This is important stuff, you know, by doing, you know, by, by making sure that you, you buy from, you know, from, from. Uh, fair trade or, you know, environmentally sustainable sources, um, you know, supporting community groups with, with free meeting space is a cool thing to do. Maybe you give a bit to charity, maybe you're giving 5% mm. of profits. To Those are all wonderful things to do, but they won't make you a social enterprise on their own. If you're in an innovation space, you would 
need to change your business model then to become a, a social enterprise, why would you decide to do that? What would be the motivator? I mean, the motivator for many people is they want to make a bigger difference. You know, yeah, okay. We only have this, you know, we're, we're here for a limited amount of time and what, how is it that we derive meaning from our time here? For, not for everyone, but for many of us, we derive meaning from feeling like we're contributing yeah, to, things, yeah. to things that are bigger than ourselves, that are bigger than just our private um, gain. And so this is the kind of what social enterprise represents as well is kind of this big picture change in how we think about impact because we used to think about kind of how we provide for our personal needs and then how we support community needs in very bifurcated ways. You know, I'm going to run my business to, to build wealth. Then I'm going to take some of my wealth and I'm going to give it to good causes, you know, through philanthropy yeah. and charity. Yeah. If that's you, if, that, if, if I'm describing, you know, if you're a listener and that describes you, fantastic. Thank you very much for your contribution. That's an awesome thing to do. Um, but I guess what Social Enterprise asks is what if we could do those together? Mm. What if instead of making money over here and then, like doing pri- like making private gain over here and then contributing to the social gain over there, what if I could bring that together and do them simultaneously? So I could mm. run a so I could run a business that both generates the kind of social and environmental impact that I that I seek because that's important to me that you know that's my values and, and kind of how I derive meaning from my career. Yeah, I work, but I also you know I want to be able to keep a roof over my head and provide for my family and maybe even build up a bit of you know a little bit of a personal prosperity yeah, along the way and and why not. Um, and so social enterprise is the idea that we can kind of do these things in a more aligned way. And so for the entrepreneur, that means yet yeah, building, you, you can still have super impactful business models. You know, it's not about sacrificing the business model necessarily. Now, in some cases you might be, there might not be the same upside, the same kind of, you know, kind of monopoly mm. type, monopoly earnings that yeah. we see in some of the, the startup world, but you could still make very good money, you know, from there's going to be some massive businesses built off the back of solving climate change, for instance, in generating yeah. in generating huge amounts of low carbon power. There's going to be some massive businesses built from the shift towards sustainable food um, production yes. processes. There's going to be some massive businesses built around making our cities smarter and more efficient and more sustainable. So there's some huge commercial opportunities that are aligned with some huge um, some huge social and environmental challenges as well. Um, yeah. So that's on the entrepreneur side, but on the other side of the, of the equation, social enterprises work because customers are also looking to align their values with their individual decisions. So once again, not just being like, I, I'm just going to buy whatever I want over here, and then I'll also contribute to some community projects over there. Instead, once again, could I do those? Could I do those simultaneously? Can I get what I need? You know, the, the food I enjoy, the fashion I want to wear, the experiences I want to have. But could I could I gain those things in a way that also supports broader social benefits? And the answer is yes, I could. You know, if I mm. if I if I buy lunch from Too Good Co, I'm supporting women escaping domestic violence. If I buy clothes from the social outfit, I'm supporting refugee recently arrived refugees and migrants um, right. to to receive That's employment. Great. If I, you know, if I if I go to um, I'm trying to think of another <laughs> another, <laughs> another good example. You know, Colombo Social. Um, to eat now they're open again uh, in Western Sydney. I'm I'm also supporting in that case you know kind of refugee causes um, and overseas aid and there's you know I mean lots of more and more great examples of how we can do this and again it's not about sacrificing you know eating dinner at Columbo Social should be every bit as fun and satisfying as yeah. eating dinner at a non-social enterprise restaurant. It's just that you also know that you're doing you're doing more good than just having a good meal. And and it feels to me like. Maybe COVID, to some degree, has helped us with this. That mm-hmm. that that's become even more important now mm-hmm. to consumers. Yeah, I I totally agree. I think COVID, in the kind of medium term, will be a further kind of boost to the social enterprise movement. Or you know, I think it's fueling a greater shift in terms of people's thinkings and preferences in our direction. In the short term, it's actually a really tough time for the social enterprise sector because the social enterprise sector is dominated. By smaller businesses, right. and and we know that you know small and medium sized enterprises are really you know are really suffering um, with COVID and some of the disruptions. With lots of social enterprise cafes, um, right. small, small fashion boutiques, and things like that. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that in the broader sense, I think this is pushing people's thinking in the right direction. Many of the themes that COVID has brought to the fore. Things like local economics, you know, shorter supply chains, mm. um, more connected communities, 
equitable access to health, um, you know, mental health support and, and other types of health services. Um, all of those are themes that social enterprises have been talking about and working on for a long time. Um, and so I'm, I'm fairly bullish that, I mean, I think in general, the world is moving, you know, I, I feel I'm very uh, kind of, I guess, gung-ho about the social yeah. enterprise sector and where it's going. I really think we are going to become the dominant form of capitalism over the coming decades. And I think ultimately COVID will be a further boost in that direction. I, um, from a personal perspective, I just almost, I totally hope you're right because uh, that that is exactly where we need to go. You know, mm-hmm. I, I have done a lot of work in uh, in the environmental space over the years, and I just feel that there's this energy now behind wanting to make this more successful and and to what can we do better and I think there's a lot of confusion with small businesses so it's really why I wanted to talk to you is there's a lot of confusion about and you opened it really well about just you know donating and doing other good causes and and that's fine but yes I really I love the idea of getting in and changing it completely and and refreshing our approach to this because we just yeah. can't keep going the way we've been treating other humans and no, our right. planet. <laughs> exactly right. And we can't leave it up to government and not-for-profits to take on no. these, these real social challenges. You know, the, the for-profit sector is, you know, two-thirds of everything when it comes to kind of money and capital and resources in the system. And so the idea that we could solve these profound systemic challenges around, you know, justice and equity and sustainability, climate change and democracy using only kind of one third of the available resources seems to me yeah. to be, that that's the naive idea to me the, the, the idea that we can kind of rewire our capitalism around sustainability to me is it's not it's not to say that's guaranteed or easy it's certainly a challenge but it's it's not i think the true naivety is the idea that we might be able to not do that and still continue to have a prosperous future yeah uh, I actually, I, we, I, th- I totally believe that we absolutely have to change and that I'm hoping, like I can hear in your voice, that this is the catalyst for maybe getting us a little bit further. It, it's for a bigger business. I mean, if a lot of the smaller businesses are getting this, and so these are individuals who feel mm-hmm. passionate about it clearly, mm-hmm. who have gone out and opened a business, but we, we need to change that middle ground a bit in business don't we is do you have a, a thought process on how you can change that to a business that's already making money and has shareholders and yeah i mean there are some great examples you know again it, it's not a, it doesn't it's not a trade-off i think and that's one of the things the kind mm. of mental blocks that we have to kind of overcome is that people always assume that to do more good equals to to do less well from a commercial point of view and again, there may be some specific examples of this, you know, like, for instance, employment generating social enterprises are simply more expensive to run. You know, if you're taking, if you're putting in the effort to take people who are not employable, per se, mm, they, they yeah. don't have the skills you actually need and want, but you're going to intentionally pick people who don't have those skills in order to actually give them the chance to gain those skills. Clearly, that's taking on a huge chunk of additional work and expense versus yeah. just choosing people who already have the skills that you want. So there are certain kind of, I guess, impact models that do that do necessarily involve a trade-off, um, and people that people are willing to make those trade-offs because it is such a powerful way to make a difference uh, in the world. I think is to help people access employment who wouldn't otherwise have it. But there are plenty of other models where there isn't necessarily any trade-off. In fact, there are massive advantages in having a social purpose. So you look at someone like Unilever, for instance. And they've, they've really focused over the last, well, you know, Unilever in aggregate are by no means a social enterprise. I'm not saying they are. You know, they're a, right. huge, a huge conglomerate. But they've been building a portfolio of what they call purpose brands, of brands that do have a clear social purpose and a clear social mission. So one of the most well-known of, of those would be Ben & Jerry's. Okay. Instance, and when Ben & Jerry's sold to Unilever, they really locked into their constitution and into some of the kind of, you know, in, into, that, into that deal that they would be allowed to continue to pursue their social purpose um, and their social mission in a variety of ways. And what Unilever have discovered is that their purposeful brands, and you know, so that's Ben & Jerry's, Dove, many others, um, are significantly outperforming. They're less socially, you know, they're less purposeful brands. But then again, it's because that's what the, the market wants. Consumers mm. want, to, want to believe that they can, you know, satisfy their personal needs, but in a way that at a minimum does no harm but preferably also provides a positive 
impact to the environment or to the wider world. And so we're actually seeing a significant return on investment in terms of purpose, return on purpose. Um, and I think that's been driven in three, three main ways, where that's actually kind of hitting the bottom line in measurable, profound ways. One is around consumer preference. Yeah. Um, and I think that particularly links to maybe not even so much consumer preference, but like the communication ecosystem now is one that's very focused on sharing. You know, the yep. kind of media and communications environment before was, was all focused on interruption. People would pay to interrupt people while they're doing something else. You know, you're, you're watching the football and someone pays to interrupt you with an ad. Yep. You're, you're reading a magazine and someone pays to interrupt you. You're walking to the supermarket and someone pays someone to wear a koala costume and interrupts you with a, with a solicitation. Um, a donation request, all forms of interruption. The thing about interruption is it always favors the status quo because you need a big budget to interrupt mm. enough people. Interruption is expensive. So a, a communications world dominated by interruption is one that is always, you know, in, that, that systemically favors the status quo because it mm. favors people who already have the big, the big marketing budget. But today, you know, certainly interruption is still happening. It's still important. But, but more important today is sharing, is people mm. choosing to share your message for you with their peers. And we pay more attention to messages that come from our peers than messages that come from companies or institutions. And so this is now a world where social enterprises have a systemic advantage because social enterprises are fundamentally more worth sharing. You know, you look at you look at like who gives a crap toilet paper versus Kleenex toilet paper. You know, which of them is a more interesting thing to share? Yeah. Who gives a crap? They both toilet paper. They couldn't be more more boring, and they couldn't be more similar, really, at a product yeah. level. But when you share a picture of your who gives a crap toilet paper, you're sharing more than just the fact that you have toilet paper. You're mm. sharing something that's personal about you. You're saying, I'm a conscious consumer. I'm someone who cares about more than just my needs. I care about what the world needs and what people less advantaged, you know, more disadvantaged than me need as well. And so social enterprises are like better adapted to the communications and kind of the world that has emerged than business as usual. And so that's one of the, the things that's really driving commercial success is that great, you know, is that is there a better fit for the modern communications environment, more shareable, more likely to inspire kind of customer loyalty, more likely for people to feel to kind of recruit their friends and all of that. And we see that a lot with, you know, we run a crowdfunding platform and that's obviously a huge part yeah. of how people are launching now is by really harnessing that passion and that energy that people can have to, to support positive things. So that's mm. one. The second is recruitment. Okay. But increasingly people entering the workforce today, more and more of them, and particularly those who have options, particularly those who are well-educated, um, are more and more wanting to choose businesses that also align with their values. Deloitte did a big study recently in um, millennials and Gen Y entering the workforce in the US, yeah. and they looked at what are the key factors that, that differentiate those who ultimately leave in under two years from their first job, post-graduation, versus those that stay for more than five years. And for an organization yeah. like Deloitte, that's real money. You know, that, yeah. that's a core yeah. part of their business is the ability to attract high, you know, like yep. high quality graduates and then keep them around. Mm. And they discovered that the single biggest factor that determines whether someone leaves in under two years or stays in more than five is a sense of alignment around purpose and values with the company, yeah. whether yep. they feel like they're using their talents in a way that actually makes a difference to the world. Because yep. younger people today, again, they don't just want to like get well paid and then, and then find meaning outside of that. They want to, mm. they, they want it all. You know, young people, mm. like millennials get a bad rap sometimes as being like impatient and they want it all, they want it all right now. Actually, that's the only thing that might save us is that impatience, is that desire that I'm not going to wait until later in life to give back. You know, you, you, I'm, on, I'm on three not-for-profit boards at the moment and on two of them, I'm still the youngest person, which is shocking, I'm 41. It, yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, so you meet some pretty, you know, you meet some really accomplished people on these boards, you know, senior, successful corporate leaders. And mm. so you ask them, why did you decide to get involved? You know, why are you, why, why are you on this board? And they almost always say something to the effect of, well, I've been pretty successful in my life and I felt like it was time to give back. And you, okay. you hear that phrase a lot from people kind yeah. of older than me and you yeah. never hear it from anyone younger than me Yeah. Um, because they're not waiting until it's time to give back. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and so this is a big shift just as the communications, right. the, the communications piece is a shift from interruption to sharing. 
when it comes to kind of driving meaning, we've shifted from legacy to alignment. So people aren't waiting until the right time, usually later in life, later in career, to then give back. They're looking increasingly at what can I do right now? What are the decisions I have to make today? You know, mm. who I'm going to buy from, what I'm going to share, who I'm going to work for, and how can I make sure those decisions are aligned with my purpose and my value? And so purposeful companies are recruiting better people, keeping them for longer and inspiring them to work harder and, you know, and, and to do better work. And it's then, very exciting, isn't it, Tom? It's I mean, really I, exciting. It's really yeah. exciting. And it's unexpected. I remember when I was, you know, kind of a young social entrepreneur 20 years ago, setting up stuff and, and looking to, you know, engage corporates yep. for support. It was right when CSR, corporate social responsibility, became a really core concept. Uh-huh. And, and, you know, companies started setting up CSR departments and, we, you know, those of us who were trying to engage with them, were really excited. We're like, fantastic! At last, I put our door into the corporate. You know, you don't know how to engage these big companies. You don't know kind of who, who should I even be talking to about this stuff. And finally, there was this kind of pathway. You felt like, okay, that's where I go. I, I, I knock, yeah. on the, I knock on the CSR door. But what turned, what, what kind of, what we discovered, I guess, was that the CSR, CSR the door labeled CSR, led into a room that didn't lead anywhere else. It didn't, uh-huh. it didn't connect with the rest of the business. In a meaningful way, it was it was a little bit like that that free meeting room that the cafe might become. It was just a little plug on on the side. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't really connect with the core focus of the business, and it's actually you know unexpected. But but the, the key kind of almost the key part of big business now that is engaging with purpose is HR is the HR department because they're dealing with it every day in terms of the need to attract quality graduates and qualified mm. graduates. As they're hearing from those young people every day that they want to do something meaningful with their skills and they want to work for a business that has, you know, that has a sense of purpose, that has a, that has a focus. They, they don't just want to spend their lives making money for someone else or even making money for themselves. Um, and that's, I think, yeah, incredibly positive. Um, and then the, the third piece, the third kind of core advantage that I want to point out is I, I think that they've got an advantage in innovation as well. And that comes back yeah. to what I said just before, that I think many of the biggest social challenges are also the biggest business opportunities. And so I actually think when you focus on kind of social and environmental challenges, you're actually focusing on some of the most some of the most meaningful business opportunities in the world and that focus on solving people's real problems that social enterprises always have. Yes. Um, I think actually aligns you in a really positive way for the future innovations you're gonna need to you know to succeed and thrive in the future. Um, and so, you know, to come back to the theme that we started on, there doesn't have to be there there is every possibility for people to be, you know, outrageously successful. In, in business and life while also doing the right thing yeah. for people and planet. The decision now for many entrepreneurs and business leaders who are, who are listening is that, you know, they may not be doing, having a social enterprise at the moment. Mm-hmm. But I somewhat feel like going ahead, if they intend to be around for a longer term, mm-hmm. is that there's going to be a massive cost in not doing it. Oh, that's exactly right. And I think that's the shift that we ultimately want to see is right now social enterprises are noteworthy, hence this yeah. conversation. We're like, how cool are social enterprises? How interesting, yeah. how exciting, how inspiring. Yeah. Uh, where we want to get to is where where social enterprises are not noteworthy or interesting or inspiring. They're kind of boring and obvious <laughs> and to be expected. Um, and, and what might stand out more is the end, you know? So we need to kind of shift the norm. Yeah. Not, just, not just not just the outliers, not just a few cool examples, but we actually need to you know shift the the baseline. And I think that's I, I really think that's happening. I think you're seeing more and more main. And you know some of this is is what gets called greenwashing. Yeah. You know where businesses pretend yeah. to be more ethical than they are, and and you know people come down on that hard as they should. But I always see that big picture as kind of quite a positive trend, because the fact that they even care enough to try yes. and pretend shows that they're feeling the heat. Now it's, mm-hmm. on, now it's on us not to allow ourselves to to be conned, you know, not to, <laughs> not to allow people to get away with. If companies, you know, companies just, uh, you know, are kind of sociopathic at their core because um, they're just trying to, they're kind of blindly trying to maximize their own outcomes if they're not really, yeah. if they're not led by very clear moral, ethical leadership. Um, and so they will just, you know, they'll, they'll, many of them, not all of them, you know, not if they have that leadership, but many of them will just try and do the minimum, you know, if they can just, if they can just do a little bit of a grants program and that'll be enough or if they can just, you know, put, yeah. 
put some green packaging, literally just green packaging, yeah, <laughs> on their yeah. on their products, and, and enough people will somehow reinterpret that as being a green product. Therefore, um, they'll get away with that. So it's on us not to allow that to be enough. But the fact mm-hmm. that they're even now trying shows how profoundly the culture is shifting. Yes, uh, because 15 years ago people didn't try and greenwash because <laughs> there just wasn't, or 20 years ago because there just wasn't much point in tr- pretending to be more environmental than you were. The the, the niche of people who who focused on that was too small. Mm. But now that niche is becoming ever larger. And so I think we'll, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll see more and more kind of social enterprise products just slip into the mainstream. I'll give you an example mm-hmm. of that, actually. I think like um, free range eggs is a specific mm-hmm. example of where that's happened in a specific product category. But if you go to Coles, it doesn't sell cage eggs anymore. Um, you know, right. so, so we've shifted from, a, from, you know, 20 years ago, you'd have to go to kind of a specialist shop to get mm. free range eggs. You'd need to go to... I often think about this. We used to have a little supermarket near where I am on the, the lower North Shore of Sydney, um, which was, you know, a specialist organic, you know, boutique yeah. supermarket kind of. Uh, and we'd go there and do a chunk of our shop, couldn't get everything. But, you know, and it would be, you know, and, it, and it's that classic kind of what I think of as social enterprise 1.0 in a way, which is which is social enterprise as a niche. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's been so, social enterprise that new. There's always been, you know, uh, kind of environmentally focused, ethically focused businesses such as this supermarket, and they would need normally be, you know, you'd, you'd have to kind of essentially sacrifice. Mm. It's a shop that you need to go out of your way, you need to go to multiple shops because you could never get everything you wanted mm. for this one shop. You usually pay a bit more. Mm. And so I think that's kind of social enterprise 1.0, and people measured it in different ways, but it was, you know, 10 to 15% of the market more or less fell, fell into that ethical consumer kind of niche that mm. was willing to sacrifice, willing to kind of, Go out of the way, pay a bit more, put up with less. And I think social enterprise two point is where we need to win parity. You know, where we are, where we now kind of grow out and take over the mainstream. And that to me is represented by the fact that I can now go to the mainstream supermarket, I can go to Coles and Woolworths, and and find many ethical and social enterprise products on the shelves. Mm-hmm. And I know you no longer need to go out of your way to find free range eggs; they're everywhere. And in fact, mm-hmm. in many places, they're the only eggs. And so now it kind of stands out. I don't know if you know this for yourself. Sorry, you, you see caged eggs. You're like, whoa, caged eggs. That, <laughs> yeah. That's pretty that's weird. That's pretty weird and dodgy. Um, yeah. And I kind of think that's what we want. That's what we're going for for the whole economy. Um, that the the social option becomes just what we expect. Yes. And, and then if things are kind of and then and then what kind of stands out is not the social enterprises, but the anti-social enterprises, and that we should be kind of putting the pressure on them, obviously. But we have a little way to go yet. So I think this, yeah. is still, this is why it's still such a profound moment, I think, for social entrepreneurs to commit to this path because you can still really get huge advantages right now. I think in 10 years, those advantages will be less because it will be less distinctive to have, yeah. that, to have that social mission. But right now, it's still a, it's still a key differentiator in the yeah. market. It's still a reason why people will pick you versus someone else. It's still a reason why they'll be more passionate and be more likely to share and be yeah. more likely to stick with you through thick and thin. So you've already, you know, the hard work's been done, the, the concept's been broken out there in the world, so you're mm-hmm. not launching something completely foreign and new, but mm-hmm. you still could be new in your space to do that. And the first, and of course, as, as most of us know, that that gets better publicity mm-hmm. and all the rest of it. So, yeah, very yeah, good. Perfect. So if someone out there is listening and they want to, they have a bit of an idea or maybe they've actually let's let's start with this way maybe they've got an existing business and mm-hmm. they think I want to pivot during this particular time how yep. do I how do I start going about making it a social enterprise I think you could start by looking at what's all the things I could do that kind of align with my existing business activities so um, one of the one of the I think the, the best places to start for that is to look at the B Corp assessment so yep. we're a, we're a proud B Corp, um, and so B Corp is a is like a third party certification to ethical businesses, a little bit like you know fair trade, but instead of looking yep. at fair trade, it looks at one aspect: how well do you pay farmers and producers? This looks at kind of everything. Well, two hundred different data points mm. about about your company, from ranging from you know how many of your suppliers are minority owned or women owned to you know what kind of power are we are you using sustainable or unsustainable to what's the gap between your highest and lowest paid staff member. So what's the representation of women or minorities on your board or in your leadership team to are you providing, are you, are you giving donations, doing philanthropy, allowing your staff to have volunteer time, all of that sort of stuff. And you don't need 200 out of 200, you need 80 out of 200. Right. So you, get, you need to find 80 points. 
to become a certified B Corp. But what I love about that process is it's a, it's a really good cheat sheet of here are all the different levers within your business. Yeah. You know, here are all the different ways. And again, none of those will necessarily make you a social enterprise. B Corps, we're a B Corp and a social enterprise, but there are many B Corps who we wouldn't consider to be social enterprises. They don't have an impact model at the very heart of their business, but they're doing everything they can around that, which I think is really right. awesome. And so it's a, I think what's great about B Corp is it's this huge list of, of things that you can improve and that you might not have even thought about. Like, yeah. have you, have you, have you really spent any time thinking about who, you know, who you buy your stationery from or your power from and whether they, whether you can align those with social enterprises or ethical yeah. sources. And so it's a, it's a really easy kind of cheat sheet for how mm-hmm. to be an ethical business. And then I think once you've got those pieces in place, you can start to ask maybe bigger and more profound questions as to what would it look like to put impact at the heart of our business. And that may involve, you know, significant changes to your core business model, or it may involve developing new products built from the ground up with Mm -hmm. that real social framework. So you see a lot of, again, non-social enterprises, but who have kind of almost like individual social enterprise type products because they've reimagined, you know, an interesting example about me that I was reading about the other day is Semex, which is... um, The, the massive con- concrete company out of Mexico, owned by Carlos okay. Williams, the world's fifth richest man or something. So it's certainly not a social enterprise. You know, concrete <laughs> actually quite yeah, environmentally very, impactful very, yes. and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but one of the things that they did that's been used as a case study is they reimagined how people were able to buy concrete in order to work with people who were living in slums, essentially, mm-hmm. and who were only able to do very kind of incremental improvements on their on their dwellings. Mm-hmm. One of the challenges always was that was that to buy any kind of concrete, you needed, like the quantities involved, made it impossible essentially for people to buy small amounts to do small improvements to the living space, which is all they had the capacity to do. Yep. And the Semex launched a division, but essentially it was just you know it, it could be as simple as just allowing people to buy it in different different quantities, but that facilitates a really different type of market. That's what they call the base of the pyramid. You know mm. the the several mm. billion people on Earth existing on yeah. a few dollars a day. Um, you add that all up, and there's still a very significant market there. But in order to serve that market, you often need to reimagine a product so that it can be bought in smaller increments or paid off over time or uh, uh, a lend to buy type of a model or things like that. So for big companies or existing businesses, moving more in a social direction may look something like that, where it's right. opening up a new product line, mm-hmm. um, reimagining, you know, the, the pricing, the delivery, the service around that product to, to suit a different market than who they're currently serving. I'm going to jump and change subjects just a little bit here. And I, I want to, because you, I read a great article you wrote on LinkedIn, the innovation paradox mm. and this particular statement. And I wanted to get a further take on this is you say good ideas look like good ideas, yeah. but great ideas look like bad ideas mm-hmm. I think that's exactly right because great ideas are somewhat unexpected you know that's innovation you know, innovation mm. is not just an incremental improvement normally it's a it's a evolutionary improvement it's a you know, generational improvement on something and and those kinds of ideas often look impractical or unlikely to work mm. well I mean they don't just look unlikely to work they are unlikely to work yes uh, <clears throat> So, you know, what, what I mean by good idea is something that you, you know, you, like someone pitches you their idea and your instant reaction is like, oh, what a good idea. Yeah. You know? and, but I think those that, and I think that happens more commonly with good ideas than great ideas. And, and, and why we have that reaction to good ideas is good ideas make sense. They fit mm. the status quo. You hear it. I'll tell you, I think the best idea I've heard recently in, in this kind of good idea, and I, I don't mean good versus great to disparage at all. We need lots of good ideas. Yes. Um, I more mean kind of how easily, easy to grasp and how well it fits with the existing kind of parameters. And so good ideas often also don't challenge power. They can be more commonly focused on symptoms, how you address problems rather than how you prevent them. Um, and therefore they kind of work with our existing understanding of the world. You know, they say, what if we changed this particular thing? You go, yeah, it's a great idea. So, you know, a good example I came across recently is Sebian. If you're familiar with these guys, great, great Australian company that really has floating rubbish bins in in the water, in the marina, right. in the harbors that are capable of scooping up all the micro oh, material right. that, are, awesome. that, are, that are building up and also measuring over time. But, you know, that's, a, that's, that's like, to me, the essence of a good idea. It says, you know how we have rubbish bins on land 
Yeah. What if we had them in the water as well? And you go, of course we can. That makes perfect sense. That, what a good idea. Um, but so I think a great idea will normally challenge something about the way, you know, challenge our assumptions about how yeah. things have to be or what's possible. So when you hear it, you go, oh, it sounds good, but that's never going to work. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's more, uh, you know, an idea that's more in the genre of how would we end homelessness rather than how could we just provide a few more beds in Sydney. Um, and what's interesting to note, though, is that many of the most disruptive, successful companies in the world today fell into that category initially. Mm. You know, when people first heard about Airbnb, that people would let strangers come and yeah. there in the house, people said that is not going to work. Not going to work. <laughs> um, and it turned out to be a great idea. But lots yes. of people would into that. It's funny when when I first heard that idea, actually, I thought I, I thought that's definitely going to work because I was already I've been um, involved in couch surfing, if you're familiar okay. with that, which was yeah. people just there was no money ever exchanged hands for couch yes. surfing, literally. And so I'd done a bit of that, and I thought uh, if if like five percent of the world are, are willing to let strangers come, or even one percent, yeah. are willing to, for nothing, I'm sure that eight percent will do it for money. <laughs> um, yes. Yes. And so I wasn't surprised. But for many other people, they just thought that just broke their preconceptions too much that they would, that, you know, that they couldn't imagine a world where everyone would be that comfortable allowing perfect strangers to borrow their yep. house or their car. Um, Facebook, people didn't think would work at all. I mean, yeah. even like, like Snap sounded absurd to almost everyone when it was first presented. You're going to share messages and then they will be deleted. Yeah. And then they were like, what are you talking? I remember the first time I heard that, I'm like, why would I want to do that? <laughs> like, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. <laughs> I, if I get a father sharing something, I wish you'd be able to find it tomorrow because I reckon it's going to be really good. Um, so those are the sorts of great ideas. And, and how they how they tend to succeed in the commercial sector is there's a, cl- there's a category of investors prepared to fund really unlikely to work ideas known as angel investors. Yeah. And so the kind of big picture, the, the kind of commercial startup investment world, you could kind of put into two broad buckets. Angel investors who invest their own money very early, normally yeah. before, often before there's been any revenue, any launch, maybe no business model even yet. Um, and so because they're investing their own money, they can do so on whatever parameters they like. They can be as risky mm. as they want to be. They don't have to justify to anyone else. They can be like, I just like this guy and I want to help them out. Or they could be like, I just think this is a fascinating topic. I want to see what happens. Yeah. Um, and then there's a category of investors called venture capitalists, VCs. Yes. And they largely invest other people's money. And that means they have to justify their decisions. They have to be able to look someone in the eye and say, this is why we invest in this company. And so they, they want to be able to reference data in order to justify that. Not just like, I just have a good feeling about it. Yeah. But rather, you know, this is the cost of active, this is what it costs them to acquire a customer, this is the lifetime value, this is the size of the potential market. It all, it all stacks up. Yeah. Let's, let's do this. Um, and so what a lot of people don't realize about that dynamic is they assume that you have to become investable to raise investment, but mm. it more commonly happens the other way around. People get investment and use that investment to become investable because at the point at which they raise those first funds from angels, they, they aren't actually investable by any conventional metrics. Um, and so the challenge we have in the social sector is essentially that it's a world with all VCs and no angels. But right. almost, almost everyone that has capital for social change is responsible to someone else. Mm. And, and that's neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It's just a dynamic yeah. in the sector. And so everyone wants to make smart decisions based on yeah. data, which is why you see this huge push for impact measurement. And impact measurement is good. We need to know what's working or not. But yeah. you can't use impact measurement to decide what's worth investing in in the first place. You know, Impact measurement will never help us innovate. It yeah. can only help us scale what's already shown to work. And the problem is that too few, that basically the kind of the people who want to invest in social innovation, social progress, have almost all clustered at that VC kind of stage in the process. And a big part of that is this anti-innovation question that tends to get out. This is why, you know, Start Some Good began life when I was living in San Francisco. And it's not a coincidence because it was there that I really felt like I experienced for the first time what a true innovation ecosystem looks like. Right. And it actually looks like a lot of failure. It looks like it looked like trying a lot of things. No one is smart enough up front, you know, to separate out the actually bad ideas from the great ideas that look like bad ideas. The mm. only way you separate them out is by running experiments, by doing yeah. things. And yeah. so in the commercial startup world, essentially angel investors, you can think of them as they pay for the experiments. And then VCs pale to scale the successful ex- experiments. Right. That's how science happens as well. But the way we the way we fund social progress is a little bit like if we only agreed to fund a scientist if he could promise us what the results of the experiment were going to be up front. Um, 
but of course you can't actually learn can't anything that. that way. Yeah. No, exactly. But that's essentially what we're demanding of people. And so right, the question, yeah. that, and, and so what I really experienced in the Bay Area was this really incredible, this kind of generative question that I, I felt like people tend to ask in the startup sector, which is they'd hear a new idea and they'd say, could it work? What, what, what would it mean if that worked? Mm. What would be possible if this were true? Whereas in the social sector, I feel like the question we tend to ask, people tend to ask is, will it work? Mm. If I fund this, if I give you this money, will, will this happen as you said? Prove to me that it's going to work. Make me feel totally confident mm. that if I give you these dollars, you will produce the outcomes you promised. And of mm. course, innovation, you can never really promise that. No, no, it's a, it's a yeah, very like, difficult well, I don't know. I don't know for certain if it's going to work or not. I think it is. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm committing my time and effort and passion you know, to this. Yeah. You know, I think it's going to work. But I can't promise you it's going to work. I need to, yeah. I need to find out. Um, and so I think we just need to get much smarter at how we how we kind of balance those trade-offs. It's, it is much harder in our sector. You know, in the, in the commercial yeah. startup, it's a really easy equation for an angel investor, which is, yeah. the, you know, because angel investors, most of them, Accept a 95% failure rate. You know, that if I make 100 investments, 95 of them will fail completely, provide, right. provide zero return. But all I need is one of them to provide 100x return. Yeah. And the entire portfolio is covered. So if I've got one Airbnb, one Dropbox, one Facebook, <laughs> one, one Instagram or whatever, I'm sorted. I just need one big win. Yeah. And so they focus on big wins. Mm. And, and in some ways, this is a different unhelpful bias in some contexts, which is that every one of those hundred have to at least be conceptually possible of returning 100x. Mm. So sometimes the missing gap for, in the commercial startup world is for like cool, sensible ideas that w- that might only produce a 10x return on investment rather than 100x. And yeah. investors can't invest in those, more or less. No. The, the model yeah. has to be that you need one big hit. Yeah. Um, and so that has its own, I guess, flaws and biases. But where, mm. but, but to me, it seems very attractive compared to this world where we kind of every foundation is trying to bat as close to 100 out of 100 as yeah. they can. And the only way you bat 100 out of 100 is by doing unambitious things. Yeah. Um, and so this is, you know, this is what I think is the innovation paradox that we need to get better at supporting things that probably won't work. Because if we try more of the things that probably won't work, we'll discover that some of them, in fact, do work, and they're not just an incremental improvement on a challenge, but they could be a kind of transformative improvement in how we address homelessness, how we engage people mm-hmm. in democracy, how we incorporate and, and celebrate, you know, recent arrived refugees or the original Australians for that matter. You know, I think there's there's a lot of innovation required. And so that's kind of right where we sit. Our entire mission is to increase the pace of innovation for social change. Mm-hmm. And everything we do is to try and essentially overcome that gap. And that's why we started with crowdfunding, because crowdfunding turns out to be a great tool for building It's a great capital. website. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's get the plug in. Um, but uh, but what what crowdfunding kind of does to address that challenge I was just talking about is is is, is basically diffuses risk across a wider group of people, and therefore it breaks it down to each of our uh, each of our kind of acceptable level of risk. You know, I wouldn't if you have a cool new idea for a social enterprise, I couldn't give you fifty thousand, and I couldn't give you five thousand. I probably couldn't give you five hundred dollars, but if I think it's super cool, I could give you fifty. Yeah. 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 And so if you could find another hundred, or yeah, hundred or two hundred yeah. or three hundred of me, yeah, yeah, you know that that, that and, and and if it turns out not to work, I'll be like, oh well, you know, it was fifty dollars. It was worth a try, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and like, hopefully, we all learn something from it, and that we'll do better next time. Mm. Um, and so crowdfunding is playing a really important role in the ecosystem in helping people try new things and essentially fund mm. experiments. It's not in and of itself. Uh, it, it hasn't kind of replaced the other sources of capital. If you added up like all the successful crowdfunding, it sounds impressive, but it's it's a fraction of all the funds that get, you know, yep. like when you look at grants and impact investments or mainstream investments, it's, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of that. Um, and so I think the best way to think about crowdfunding to some extent is not as an alternative source of capital, but an alternative source of validation, an alternative source of, of, of evidence. Yeah. That the thing That's a great that way of looking at it. It's worth doing. If you can, if you can show that there, are, you know, if you can, if you can get a couple hundred customers on board, it doesn't have to be mm. thousands. That's gonna, that's gonna, that's gonna really impress people. That is literally mm. infinitely more data than you had before. Mm. Beforehand, you just had a hope and a prayer and a dream that people yep. want the offer. Now you can prove that people want the offer. 
Um, you, you, you know, they, they may or may not believe you that, that's a, that, that it will continue to grow or scale, but you clearly have a much stronger foundation to now go and pitch for funds. And you can, you have a lot more, you know, much more a stronger evidence base to yeah. say, I'm on the right track. I'm doing something that people are responding to. And that's true for yeah. social enterprise and not for profit top as well, by the mm-hmm. way. That's, yeah. Social enterprise example is proving that people will pay for it. You know, that people will actually buy the product or service. Yes. Uh, but the not-for-profit example is just as just as crucial, proving that the community will co-invest in it. That mm. whatever, whatever the work you're doing on behalf of that community, that the community is actually willing to also put some of their own resources in it to, to demonstrate how much they want to see it happen. Yeah. So we, we partner quite a bit with, you know, local governments and, and other fa- and foundations these days, and we often do kind of matched funding mechanisms. Okay. And how we pitch that is we say, if essentially, if, if this idea could go out there and raise half its budget from the community, would that provide you with enough confidence and evidence that you would provide the other half? Um, mm-hmm. And it becomes a lot easier, therefore, for those sorts of funders to kind of take that take that leap to kind of invest in something that doesn't have full evidence yet, because part of the evidence becomes the fact that the community was willing to invest in the other half provides the evidence base that it's also that it's worth you paying for the other half. That's great, Tom. So I can, you know, clearly now I can see that. Well, if someone has an idea, they've got somewhere to go. So, they, and I, I love the idea actually of getting some almost data from from the crowdsourcing, yeah. crowdfunding to start with, and okay. and utilizing that to explore, go beyond that, and yeah. and then yes, because of the opportunities right at the moment and people's consciousness, mm-hmm. I think is just more in tuned with wanting the world to be a better place than what it is right now, and it will be, we can do that together. I think that's really good. The other thing I wanted to just, before we wrap up here, is to um, give you a bit of a plug because you've got a social enterprise course happening with The Good Hustle. And, I again, I checked out that side as well, and it, it looks great. It looks like a great opportunity for people. Share, me, share with me what... Yeah, yeah. So tell me, tell me why, what would, just briefly, why, why will people, what would they enjoy? What would they get from it? For sure. Thank you so much uh, for that question. I was just thinking to myself, how was I going to work that in? <laughs> <laughs> well, we wanted to mention it before we wrapped up. So thank, thank you for making that so easy for me. Um, Good Hustle is our social enterprise design course. So it's a 10 week cohort based online program to design a launch or growth ready social enterprise. We launched it about a year ago. So we're currently enrolling, I think, our seventh cohort into the program and the results so far have been really amazing, everything we hoped for. Um, and a big part of that in terms of our motivation was that we see a lot of people at our crowdfunding. You know, we talked before, you mentioned, you know, it's a great place to start. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a great place to, like, it's a, it's a great next step for a lot of people, but it's not mm-hmm. the very first step, you know, because you've really no. got, because to succeed at crowdfunding, you need to do a lot of work before yes. in terms of refining your idea, figuring out who it's for, nailing your value proposition, your theory of change, etc. So we work really hard at our crowdfunding platform to not just give people the tools, but to teach them how to use them effectively as well. But there's only so much you can do when you, yeah. when you, when people, because people only tend to come to the platform, you know, a week or two before they want to launch their campaigns. Yeah. So there's only, you know, with a week or two to go, there's only so much you can, you know, you know, there's no time to start reimagining your impact, your theory of change, or your, your business model. We'll help them refine how they express those things, hopefully, and, and who they want to express them to. But you can't go, you know, too much deeper than that in that time frame. And so what we realized we really wanted to do, you know, we just see so many people who are, you know, great people with, with, with a great idea, but they just, they're not ready to share it. Mm-hmm. They're not ready to launch that idea to the community yet because they just haven't got that really foundational, um, I guess, clarity and credibility and carefully chosen communities and mapping out the channels to reach that community or finding their own courage to get out there, which is our five C's formula for successful crowdfunding, clarity, credibility, communities, channels, and courage. Um, and that we had an opportunity essentially that we'd learned so much over nine and a half years of getting people, of working with people as they launch things. Um, we have the highest project success rate in cause crowdfunding, but that's 53%. So we work wow. super hard and about half get, about half reach their goals and about half that don't. And we really wanted to, I guess, engage with people earlier mm-hmm. where we could share more of what we've learned while it could still make the biggest difference when they were still at a design and planning phase. Yeah. So Good Hustle essentially reverse engineers everything we've learned over almost 10 years helping people launch impact initiatives and turns it into a clear 10-step process of here are the pieces that you need to nail, that every social enterprise needs to nail in order to be launch or growth ready. Um, and then so some of the, some of the I guess, the, the unique elements 
of that is one that it's derived from real world experience. You know, we've been in the trenches with thousands of entrepreneurs mm-hmm. as they seek to get something out there. And we've, we've learned so much about what it takes to succeed at that moment that we can help people therefore get ready for that moment. The mm-hmm. second is that it's taught by entrepreneurs. It's not just like a set of syllabus that was delivered, that was developed in the lab. So while we have mapped the pathway or the, the formula, we are not the experts at teaching all of those pieces. You know, there are some pieces that, okay. we, feel, that we feel very versed at teaching, but others that we know there are people who are much better than us. And so we've curated, we've brought together many of those pieces. The core content is taught by nine teachers, every one of whom is a founder of a social enterprise, um, both from within Australia and around the world. And then the third piece is that it's a it's a community experience, that you're working with a cohort. Um, so it's, you're not just solo on your own trying to figure it out. You have enormous opportunities, not just to learn from entrepreneurs who are further down the, you know, down their journey yeah. from you, but also yeah. from people who are at a similar stage in their journey. And so there's an online peer learning platform as well as peer learning groups that meet regularly throughout the course. Oh, well done. Sounds great, actually. I, people, yeah, I mean, people seem to really enjoy it. We really enjoy yeah. it. We really enjoy teaching it and hosting it. Um, it's it's a, it's a mix of, you know, pre-recorded content, but also lots of, you know, real human contact, live group coaching calls, live Q&As with experienced entrepreneurs, peer support groups. Um, and, and what we've heard from people who have completed it is it's really helped them clarify some core elements of their of their plan, you know, in mm-hmm. terms of, you know, really figured out how to make their story or their pitch land or really figured out who it's actually for. They were telling the wrong people yeah. uh, or, or like identifying the right business model for them. Often that's often a weakness, not for everyone, but for many social entrepreneurs are very clear on their impact model, but mm-hmm. haven't figured out how to back that up with a business model. And of course, right. the enterprise is trying to get those two pieces mm-hmm. um, working together. Um, so it's been it's been really fun. It's been cool to kind of then see what people have gone on and done as well. We've had people, you know, launching online summits or apps or services businesses with a focus on um, working with not for profits or ethical businesses or, or new social enterprises. A variety of you know, it's incredible the different causes that people are working on. Is one of the real learning experiences from this is that while we might be kind of experts on social enterprise, they're experts on their particular issue. Mm. So we learn a lot about, you know, kind of the challenges for kids who are aging out of residential care or, you know, the challenges of, of, of how, to, how do we help uh, increase enterprise development in Indigenous communities to create, you know, use entrepreneurship to provide jobs locally and all sorts of, you know, important, fascinating topics that we, said, um, that we yeah. learn about as well. So it's a really cool... Yeah, exactly. Experience. If I could just uh, give a quick final shout out. The next one starts on August 3rd. Um, yes, good? and I think we're going to we're going to put this to air on um, the thirty first, so that we can make sure we match that for you. So, yeah. so that'll uh, work out really well. And look, that actually sounds like a fabulous program because I, you know, I think so many people have, well, a lot of people have these visions of what they would like to see in the world, but making money out of it. I mean, I've been there, done that. So, yeah. it's like can be often difficult. And I think if you can marry. And, you know, I, immediately for me, the thing that I can see from my past experience is being able to marry and get someone who's had experience in doing this of the business model, making money out of it, which unfortunately we still need to do, right. and and making it with a with a social purpose and a, and a and and that real objective to solving a real need, community need. So I love that. Yeah, thank you so much for your time today. No problem at all. Thank you so much for the opportunity to have a, to have a chat with you. I, I didn't get to hear about Tom, the person, at all, but it's fine because there's just so much. To, clearly, I know what Tom the person's about. He's clearly driven and passionate about doing social good. That's right. That is a pretty that is a pretty defining characteristic um, <laughs> for me. So I um, appreciate the chance to, to explore that. And look, if people want to keep up with me a bit more, you know, with you know, both, both, I guess, what I have to say and share about social enterprise with some of the slightly broader topics that I, I get interested in. Um, I'd love to invite everyone to connect with me on Twitter, uh, if that's one of their, one of their networks. Uh, I'm Tom JD on Twitter and for, and, and for potentially on LinkedIn as well. Um, I keep it, I keep it more focused on social enterprise, um, exclusively there, but those are my two main kind of public. Too easy. We'll, we'll put all these links in the show notes anyway, Tom, so that people can just connect with it, um, with your, with Good Hustle, of course, and even if they want to check out the Start Some Good, they might even want to invest themselves in uh, yes, please some check new out idea. All of our stuff, goodhustle.online, startsomegood.com. Excellent. Thank you again so much, Tom. It was awesome.